Okay, so we can start. This is our first uh, topical seminar of uh, these uh, hacks. And we have uh, here with us uh, Doug that uh, we present uh, some motivation for EIC. Uh, he's a senior scientist here at JLab, and uh, they are all yours. Awesome, thank you so much. And I'm gonna get it started, give a high level picture, give a little bit of history, the timeline, and then there will be the real talk from Julia, who's sitting in the back, and she's going to go into the details of the detector. She can answer all the hard questions. So I'm up here to have fun. All right. I don't know which hand. Sorry. I don't know which hand. All right. Here we go. All right. I'm a Jefferson Lab employee. I've been a Jefferson Lab employee for 20 years. I showed up here 21 years ago as an MIT postdoc, and I just never, ever left. And now they can't figure out how to get rid of me. <laughs> I love Jefferson Lab, I love the physics we do, and I still love the physics we do. But I'm giving the AIC talk. I'm gonna start off by saying a little bit about JLab physics, because there's still all kinds of cool stuff we can do here. There's over a decade of physics to do here with the 12 GB beams. There's lots of new ideas. And for those of you who will be around on July 11th is when the next program advisory committee meeting is. This is where the scientists go, and maybe even some of your advisors, they have an experimental idea, they want to run it in this lab, you have to defend it in front of an advisory committee. Uh, they are tough, and they're tough on the experiments. The idea isn't sound, the physics isn't sound, they kick you out. On the other hand, that's where the experiments we do come from. So the ones that make it through, it's usually about third progress. Um, that's what can possibly get scheduled. Know that those that progress, even some of those never uh, get done. And there's lots of new ideas, and hopefully you'll hear about some of these uh, during the Hugs lectures. Um, positrons instead of electrons at Jefferson Lab is a possibility. Reverse the polarity of the dipoles, set up the injector differently. Uh, there's a brand new topical collection on those ideas. Uh, there are already some approved experiments from recent packs. So this is two years ago, pack 48. And they're now even really cool ideas about increasing Jefferson Labs energy without increasing our footprint. And there are some really amazing uh, nonlinear accelerator optics makes that possible. All right, so that's JLab. Why is EIC interesting and what questions will it address? All right, these are not my answers to one of the key scientific questions of the electron ion collider. This is from a National Academy of Science report. Uh, on my slides, the link is here. Uh, you have to click around to say, give me a free copy, but you can get the report for free. You don't have to pay. So it goes into great detail why the electron ion collider is interesting. And these are the big questions. How do nuclei properties of mass and spin emerge? Are protons inside the nucleus distributed in momentum and position space? Look at color charge, jets interacting with the nuclear medium. How's a dense nuclear environment affect? Quarks and gluons. Now, some of these questions are very similar to questions we ask at Jefferson Lab, but we ask in a different kinematic range. So, electron ion collider, you're often concerned with C quarks. So, if you want to imagine a proton, you want to be naive about it, right? I think proton, I got two up quarks and down. As I zoom in my microscope, look at very low hurricane X, I start to see the C quark and quark pairs, gluons, it gets incredibly complicated. So Jefferson Lab tends to push to the high X, where that simple-minded picture, the valence quark picture, comes into play. And the EIC is going the other way, and they're looking where the low X, where the C quarks and gluons are really matter. And to put that into a kinematic chart, so here I've taken uh, the Burkean X variable. I'm an experimentalist. Since I measure everything, this is easy peasy. It's a four momentum transfer squared by my two, mass on my target, energy of the beam minus the energy coming out. That's it. Elastic scattering. So I'm coming out with my beam, hit a proton, proton stays intact, doesn't excite. That's a Birkin X of one. If I knock the living daylights out of it, make all kinds of stuff coming out, I'm down here at low end. And also probing the C again. So balance quark region, C quark region. And this probably has one thing that I wish I had time to change. Uh, Jefferson Lab, of course, does not stop at a cube squared of one. I just to decided to cut it off one. We keep going. Someone put a deep elastic cut there and then didn't do it for the other lab. Anyway, 
when you glance at this, you might go, oh, wow, look, EIC can pretty much do everything. Yes and no. Sure, if I just want a few events, it does everything. EIC can go to X near one, and Q squared us several thousand. Great. There's no rate. I like to do experiments that get done in some reasonable amount of time. So the one dimension that's not shown on this plot that you can have come out would be luminosity. And experiments in this region at my X tend to be very hungry for luminosity. So for example, the experiment Hall C coming up, uh, doing pi on LC experiment, they want the highest beam energies we can deliver. They want the highest currents we can deliver. They went on thick target. Single wave luminosity is 10 to the 38, 10 to the 39. This blows what EIC could ever do away. On the other hand, Jefferson Lab can't reach into these, these connects. So each, each of these facilities has a region where they do really well. Physics they can do really well. And as you can see on this plot, there's nothing out here yet. So this is where the EIC is going to absolutely shine. And again, just to get back to that luminosity, so Hall C 10 to 38, 39, uh, the best EIC does at their optimized center of mass energy, this is their 10 to the 34. Uh, one thing to just stick in the back of your head, if you will hear people talk about EIC luminosities, it's not a flat line. It's not like they hit one luminosity, it's true over all center of mass energies. There is an optimal where they've tuned this machine up, it's designed for a particular center of mass energy. It shall be able to have a dynamic range, but you will roll off uh, the max. This can, of course, be improved as a function of time with more money effort, but the baseline will look something like this. Uh, yeah. I messed up the No, 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 no. This, because All right. All right. Now, these should look incredibly familiar to all of you. So electron ion collider is, of course, a collider. So beam of protons, beam of electrons, or beam of ions, or beam of electrons, collide. The Feynman diagrams for the inclusive deep elastic scattering, whether I'm doing that for the AIC or I'm doing it for Jefferson Lab, it's the same Feynman diagram. And I can always boost to a frame of reference where the ions at rest. And this actually explains why the EIC can't be done here with fixed target. So I'll leave it to you as an exercise. But right now we have 11 GV beam, and I can put that on a proton target or a carbon target or a lead target. But the target's fixed and beam comes in. If I wanted to get to the same kinematics that the EIC does with a fixed target, I need TEVs of electron beam energy. It would be insane. The, the right way to do it, and the way we are doing it, is instead of trying to take just the electron energy and raise it up, if we want to get to those large kinematics, accelerate the proton beam, accelerate your target into it. But from a theory point of view, right, I can always do the boost. Um, physics is the thorough invariant, right? So I get back to my final diagram. So proton in, electron in, exchange virtual photon. Have my deep elastic scattering detect only the electron. We can do semi inclusive deep elastic scattering, detect the electron, detect the meson, for example, and then fully exclusive reactions detect the electron, other particles, meson, gamma, and proton, and variations thereof. These are the main Feynman diagrams of EIC. It is by no means exhaustive. You can go on forever, just like you can here. Many, many experiments we do, just some of the, the main ones. And these are a lot of the di these diagrams cover a lot of the questions that we'd like to address uh, for driving EIC, but certainly about the entire program. All right, so what I wanted to do today is give you a little bit of history. And it's not that long ago, so an amazing amount of progress has happened on EIC just over the last uh, few years. And Amazingly enough, COVID did not slow this down. We were kind of lucky just as things were progressing. So October 2019, there were two concepts or two laboratories like fighting, or fighting is too rough a word, competing 
Nicely. Yeah. Fighting. We're an electron ion collider. Uh, one was Brookhaven. Brookhaven has an ion machine. They are right now. They're an ion collider. They're getting ready to upgrade uh, IP8 here. This will have the Super Phoenix detector that is getting ready as we speak right now. It, they're building it up and getting ready to slide it in um, to the experimental hall. Their idea for an upgrade was to build an electron source. They were going to add an electron ring collide. Brookhaven's idea. Jefferson Lab's idea. We have an electron beam. We'll build this cool figure eight ion machine. We'll feed it from CDAP. So we have the electrons. We'll have this new custom design for the ions. Both machines had advantages. Uh, the biggest advantage of the Brookhaven machine is on a very large uh, piece of property. It allows them to easily get to very high energies. Uh, Jefferson Labs are very constrained in where we fit. We're in a, a city. Uh, Brookhaven's way out on Long Island. On the other hand, this figure eight design was actually quite clever for one thing, and that was polarization. It's really easy to store not only polarized protons, but polarized deuterons uh, in the figure eight design. This is a naturally spin preserving design. You can do the same thing uh, with a circular beam. It costs a lot of money building something called spin rotators. And to do the deuteron in particular, it's very challenging. So this one was more energy reach in my mind. This one was more polarization reach. But both designs could do the physics as outlined in the National Academy of Science report. But I couldn't move the Jefferson Lab to Brookhaven and Brookhaven to Jefferson Lab because all I really need to do is collide the electron beam from here so that they had the beam from there. We're way too far apart. So I need to pick one. All right. And this should be no shock to anyone. This was chosen as the design. And this is where life got interesting because historically, when labs have kind of had that you know, fight it out. You get the winner and the loser, right? Winner goes on, loser goes home. That didn't happen. And it's actually a much nicer model what did happen. So critical decision zero. So the CD zero, so this is the Department of Energy jargon. You can think of it as milestones. And critical decision zero is the first one. It's a statement of need. It's when the US Department of Energy makes a statement that the United States needs electron ion collider to stay preeminent in the field of nuclear physics. And then they point to the National Academy of Science report to show the physics it will be able to do. And it was on this date they down selected. Well, this is date it was selected. This is the date we found out about what they decided on um, the Brookhaven design. All right. And many of us had worked hard, myself, Yulia, many, many others. So we were disappointed. That's Absolutely natural human reaction. Right? You work hard, you know, you don't win. Right? You're not happy. All right, he's happy. Most of us aren't happy. Uh, Tim Hallman came here, he actually came to talk to us. And he was like, guys, girls, look, this is your physics. So right now, Jefferson Lab does electron scattering. Those Feynman diagrams are what we're doing, it's what you're learning about. That's not what they're doing at Brookhaven right now. They're doing heavy ion collisions. He's like, guys, keep developing the intellectual ownership of the physics. Keep working. And this idea of instead of, let's say, throwing up arms, giving up, and instead of going, no, we want to do this physics. We are excited about the physics. I don't care if it's built here or there. I want to do this physics. Uh, and it really resonated. And very quickly, disappointment turned into let's work together, really work together as a team. And that has actually become formalized. And again, this isn't what usually happens, but it's a great model. So uh, Brookhaven and Jefferson Lab have signed back in May of 2020 a partnership Sorry, agreement. Sorry, Doc. Your yeah. microphone turned it off. Yeah. I don't know if it's a part of <laughs> All right. What can I use? Wait, wait, wait. Maybe just press the. I have no battery. No, uh, I have no battery. All right. Yeah, the second one. I just. All right. I'll keep going. We'll try to change about it. Uh, 
All right, are we back? Okay. So May 7th, 2020 partnership agreement. And this was great. And this is where you kind of like science to always go, right? We develop ideas, maybe we have two different ideas, but we're all trying to get the same physics goal. There's a review, one is selected, but instead of one group of scientists going, well, I can get my way. Instead, take a breather and come back together. It just, I, I hope that this model continues. I think it's fantastic. And it has been a great partnership. It brings the ideas of both groups together and more scientists thinking about a problem, uh, it, right? Just at a fundamental level better. I'm not gonna spend much time on this. I just wanted to show a formal organizational chart. Uh, this has many Jefferson lab names. Um, Rolf Fentz, who used to be the head of physics division, he's now the uh, associate project director, um, detector for EIC, and there are many JLab people throughout the EIC project. So really integrated into the project formally, um, very unique. All right, so I wanted to give you a visualization of what this upgrade will look like. Hopefully this will work. So, this is schematically what Brookhaven is like right now. So an ion injector, AGS, taking ions, a little switch shard, so they can send the ion beams clockwise, counterclockwise into a storage ring and bring it to two interaction points. This is IP6. This IP6 notation continues. It will continue into the IP, it's just the clock. Uh, locations so is six o'clock IP6. Uh, this is where the star detector is currently located. And IP8 is where the SVNX detector is going in. So two interaction points. That's what they have right now. And this is what likely coming. Right? And I say likely cooling is still one of the open issues, but you keep the ion complex piece mostly the same. You can see one of the switch yard pieces is removed. And I build, oddly enough, two electron injectors. One of them I'll call my clean one. It's the one that's got reduced polarized electron to a source. It's the same technology we have here at Jefferson Lab. So we use polarized light on strain gallium arsenide, and I can pull off polarized electrons. I'll use those for the collision. But there's a second source of electrons here where they're gonna have high current that they want to use for cooling. And this is just a cute idea, even just classically, you can think of this. You have a beam of protons, you imagine classical protons in an ensemble traveling around in a circle. I want them to collide with an electron beam. So a nice point, like electron beam and some mushy ensemble of protons. I'm not gonna hit very many of them if they're all spread out. I'd like them to be in a nice tight beam, a cool beam. And one of the ways you can do that cooling, is, it's classical. I can put the beam of elect, a beam of electrons beside it so that the protons, which are thermally moving, bump the, pro, the electrons and they will lose some momentum. So I keep refeeding this very light electrons, a half an MeV in mass, because they're a heavy proton. And I can cool it, I can cool the proton beam. That's one of the ideas. And the reason cooling is something we get excited about uh, as scientists would like to do our experiment in a reasonable amount of time is cooling means luminosity. And I can't cool and those luminosity numbers 10 to 34 start coming down to 33. And just saying numbers like that means nothing. So let's put it in terms we understand as human. An experiment that would take one year at luminosity 10 to 34 takes 10 years at 33, right? Nobody wants to stay in graduate school, get their data for 10 years. I wanna get my data in one year, analyze and get out, right? So it makes a huge difference in what science reach you can have with luminosity. And that's why people get so excited about pushing on luminosity, make sure luminosity stays up. But it goes, it goes down low enough, I'm not, I'm not gonna do any of the cool stuff. 
All right. I wanted to show this just because it was done by a Jefferson Lab uh, Sully student. This is now two years ago. But not only do they do the cooling to get the luminosity up, they do something called grabbing the beam. Uh, and I learned from Ollie that grabbing is actually a term used in helicopters. This is when you rotate your helicopter. So you're moving forward, but you rotate the helicopter, you move at an angle. You're moving like a crab. So instead of moving like this, rotate. So this, this is idealized, but it's an idea of a, I've got an elliptical ion beam interacting with an elliptical electron beam. And what she's done here is showing you what the overlap. This is just a two dimensional picture. It's a little bit of a cartoon, but still. You can see you never perfectly overlap. No kidding. What you can do, and this is what is being done, is add a so-called crab cavity. Take that bunch, perturb it so it starts wiggling. So there are a lot of quadruple magnets not shown along here to keep the beam in its nice orbit. But the beam bunch will start to oscillate, and you time it such that the electron and ion bunches perfectly overlap. And even in my little cartoon, getting that perfect overlap immediately gets me another factor of two in luminosity. So, so if one year I can do it in six months. Cool, graduate fast. But every little thing about getting luminosity up is important because it really all has to come together. That's what let, lets us hit those high luminosity numbers. All right. The other thing that's very different. Um, doing electron ion colliding or any of the collider experiments compared to Jefferson lab um, is the kinematics. Again, I can always do the Lorentz transformations uh, or just keep things in Lorentz invariant quantities like Q squared. We're all talking about the same thing. But as experimentalists, I'm usually thinking in the lab frame. So I'm thinking in this frame where I have a beam of electrons going one way, I've got my proton or ion beam going in the opposite direction. I have a collision point, and then I build a detector up around that. Now, this is extremely cartoony. So we've got a central detector region as box. We've got two end caps, one to detect the scattered electron, electron end cap, one to detect scattered, scattered hadron. Because remember, these particles are coming in relativistic to each other, they will collide. Most of the time, they'll just graze each other, right? That's why these end caps are so important. And the new terminology to get used to is the pseudo rapidity. So, for electron scattering in a fixed target facility, we always just think in terms of the angle of the scattered electron. So, whether you're in all A, B, or C, right? Electron beam comes in, I know the scattering angle is in the spectrometer or in class. It's easy peasy, it's just an angle. Here, it's more useful to talk in terms of pseudo rapidity. Uh, if I have a heavy ion collider or a proton proton collider, this is where most of the events go. Imagine I had a proton on a proton, they have the same momentum, same energy. They come in, they'll just pancake on each other. Everything will come out at zero rapidity, for most things. Anyway, I've, here I've just listed how rapidity maps to angle. So, angle zero degrees is a rapidity of infinity anyone cares but it's just a new term and if you're like me it's this is algebra it's just something to get used to all right and this is a cartoon uh this dates back to something called the yellow report which i'll mention near the end of my talk of what the electron ion collider is expected to look like and it has morphed and it's continuing to morph um, you'll see a few different uh, images of ideas that have come about as a function of time but though it keeps morphing, it gets refined. Uh, a lot of it continues to stay the same. And a lot of the detector technologies uh, in this device are the same as what we have here, though uh, some are different. Um, number of calorimeters, so these tend to be uh, lead glass blocks, um, something called side glass. Um, these are materials to stop and cause electromagnetic showers. Um, my favorite detector type, the Trankoff detectors. So these are your, your detectors where the particle is going faster than the speed of light in the material. I always thought that was cool, right? It can't go faster than the speed of light in the vacuum, but these particles can go faster than light goes in certain materials. So it can be a gas, it can be aerogel, 
uh, a number of different types of that detector. Um, Dirk is a Trankoff detector. Um, there's also a dual rich now, which is just labeled rich. Um, uh, there's also tracking detectors. Um, so they'll have uh, wire chambers, jams, uh, silicon, all brought together. And it's not so different in scale. Uh, if you walk down the hall D and look at their detector, it's actually similar in scale. This is Natalie. I think she's running for the user group, as a matter of fact. Anyway, this is a cartoon again of a possible electron ion collider detector being pulled out of the hall. And one of the fun things working at a facility that's already built, you have to deal with things that already exist, like the door. <laughs> so this is IP6. And this is a headache. So the door isn't really as big as you'd like it to be. If you're building this from scratch, you would build a bigger door. Um, civil construction is always expensive. I don't care if you're digging a hole or building a new building, you try to avoid it if you can. And the way we avoided it is we made it so these end caps, so the electromagnetic hydron end caps can come off and the main part of the detector can slide off to work on it. And this is just one scheme has can work. This picture is from here in test lab. You can go take the same shot if you want. Uh, this is the Clio magnet. This is the magnet that's planned to be used for the iron yoke for the magnet for solid. It's the same size. So whether I'm talking about the solid magnet, the magnet that's in hall D, the magnet that's inside uh, the EIC detector, they're very similar in size. They can be a little bit bigger and smaller, but the scale, this kind of human scale, you know, a radius uh, of student, is roughly, just give you guys a, a feeling. Because when you look at these cartoons, uh, at least for me, it's very difficult to figure out what the heck I'm looking at. Is it desktop or something? So, radius of a human. Now, for most scientists, I think they really like the physics of the central detector. I guess I'm a bit of a contrarian, so I actually like the physics you can do far away from that central detector. Uh, this is a diagram showing something called the far forward region. So if you imagine the scattering electron ion colliding, oftentimes the ions will just continue almost down the pipe, that pseudo rapidity of infinity. The zero degree scattering. And for me, a lot of my physics, so the short range correlation physics, uh, there's time production physics, um, gets done in this region. And this is where it gets really cool uh, and novel because I now have detectors. So instead of just all the detectors around the interaction point at the central detector, so this is the central detector. I start having little detectors along the beam line, so-called B0. So this is a dipole magnet it's a detector inside the magnet, uh, tracking detectors located near the beam, Roman pots inside the beam line. These are silicon detectors in the pipe. And then a zero degree calorimeter. So this is a calorimeter that I just go from zero degrees. So this is roughly 50 meters back to the target. So a neutron that isn't gonna get deflected by any of these magnets can end up uh, not detector, also cameras. So all kinds of neat equipment. And I just want to give one example, and there are a vast number of examples. I just want to give one. And this is one. Uh, this was published by a number of researchers. Um, these are some of the Jefferson Lab EIC fellows here. Uh, let's see, Jackson's still here. Uh, Zien is here now as our postdoc Isker fellow. Uh, and lecture. Next, next week. Oh, that's right, she's your lecturer. So if you have questions about this slide, you can ask her. <laughs> so one of the cute ideas, and this is a novel idea, this is not one of the ideas that drove the initial um, design of the detector rule, but what makes any facility like Jefferson Lab or the EIC, um, uh, CERN, any of them really rich, isn't just that initial set of physics ideas. If the only things I can do are the initial set of physics ideas Something's probably wrong, right? I mean, what, what's cool is when you keep thinking or you refine the ideas or come up with something 
just completely different. And this is in the pretty completely different category. Um, and this was doing tagging with polarized helium-3. So helium-3 is one of our go-to targets here at Jefferson Lab. So if you go to the store, buy a balloon, helium-4, two protons, two neutrons. A little bit of the helium in the blue will also be helium-3, but it's missing a neutron. Chemically, it's the same. All the same properties as helium. Medically, it's kind of cool because I can polarize helium-3 and polarize the neutron. So we've got two protons. They'll go spin against each other. And the spin of helium-3 will be carried mostly by a neutron. We know this from the magnetic moment. The magnetic moment of neutron and helium three are very close to each other. That's the first hint. Anyway, most of us have sucked on a helium balloon. Makes your voice squeaky. It's an inert gas. Fantastic for medicine. If you breathe in helium four, it makes your voice squeaky, but who cares? If I breathe in polarized helium three, you can all of a sudden do absolutely gorgeous imaging of the lungs in the MRI machine. MRI machine, magnetic resonance imaging. It's really nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. And having the polar saving three in the lungs also gives gorgeous images. The problem with the technique at the moment isn't the ideas behind it, it's the cost of helium three, which is prohibitively expensive for industrial use at the moment. And to be honest, you don't want that price to come down. Anyone know why? You know where helium three mostly came from? From the arms race. All right, also tritium. All right, so what was the most novel idea uh, Zian and others had? When we do deep elastic scattering on helium 3, this experiment we just did in all C, so electron beam in, we scatter on the polarized helium 3. I measured the scattered electron on um, deep elastic scattering kinematics. Awesome, but I can't control what I'm hitting. So even in a naive picture, I've got two protons sitting there. So I'm, I'm going to scatter mostly on protons, not neutrons. And I use polarized helium theory because I want to study neutron physics. I know that protons are already from doing proton scattering. I have a polarized proton target. So I have to do a subtraction. So I take the experimental data, inclusive electron scattering of polarized helium theory, and I correct for the proton. Yuck. Could I do it better? At the electron ion collider, what you can do is tag both protons. So if I truly hit the neutron, so just think naively again. So I've got helium three, I've got this neutron, I've got two protons. I'd like to be hitting the neutron. If I do, I've done deep elastic here in the neutron, what's left over is two protons. Since this is a collider, they're just gonna continue down the beam pipe. They're gonna go right down that far forward region and you can detect them in the Roman pots. So I can detect two protons going. All of a sudden, I know I hit the neutron and everything gets so much easier. So what's shown here is the asymmetry I get when I do an experiment like A1, where I want to be measuring A1N, A1 neutron. This is what I really get in the lab when I do that inclusive experiment. Uh, by doing the tagging, I will get what I really want to start with. Or much, much closer anyway. All right. And this is just one example of science we can do better uh, with electron ion collider, making use of the unique uh, kinematics and geometry of the far forward region compared to what we have here now. Um, this is just another paper from Jefferson Lab. One thing that I'm finding peculiar is it's relatively easy to publish papers uh, where you do studies opposed to real experiments. All right. Okay, as of October 2021, this is the schedule uh, for the electron ion collider. This changes, it's gonna change again. Uh, any kind of schedule for a project, whether it's the carriers that we build here in Newport News, y'all do know we build carriers. I'm not kidding you. That's what Newport News is a shipbuilding town, has been for decades and decades, um, back to World War I, II, before. Uh, so you can drive down to and see the, the carriers in construction. You can also see the USS Enterprise being torn apart and is decommissioned. 
Okay, but whatever the project is, whether it's the aircraft carrier or the electron ion collider, how long it takes you to get it done depends on the amount of funding you get. Right? And we haven't gotten the amount of funding we wanted, which is what's pushing things back. But nevertheless, it moves forward. So the first step is this so-called critical decision zero, the statement of need uh, from the Department of Energy. We've already passed uh, the CD1 milestone, working on CD2-3. Uh, many ways, these are steps along the way. The one that's really important in all these projects is you hit critical decision three. Why is that the really important one? That's one where big money is flowing. This is where you, when you got to this point, you have fixed your design. I know exactly what I want to build. And I'm ready to go. And you can also see on the timeline, there's a big gap between three and four. This is when you're doing the construction, the installation. So what needs to happen, and what needs to be happening right now, I need to be doing the design. I need to be taking the detector ideas uh, that the scientists have come up with. We need to start solidifying what we want to do. It doesn't have to be perfect yet, but I need to come up with the baseline. I need to come up with the rough cost and do final design so we can start construction. So this has uh, CD3. This is in fiscal years. So fiscal years in the United States uh, start in October. So it's a, the October of 2025, so you're pretty close. This is probably shifting out about six months. It's simply because we didn't, didn't get the funding level we had hoped for for the project. So if, I, if you don't get your funding, it slips. Nevertheless, uh, you can get a pretty good rough idea. So in 2030s, a few uh, electron ion colliders should be completed. It should be starting to run. We should have one detector at one of the IPs. That's what's included in the project. So anytime people start talking project, they get very formal. Uh, they start talking about these critical decisions and what's in, what's in the baseline, what's in that project. And as proposed, there's only one detector. Now, Brookhaven has two natural interaction regions, one at IP6 and one at IP8. And what is included in the budget is, is to make sure to make no decision that would preclude a second detector. Uh, what's not yet obtained a CD0 uh, is a second detector. Nevertheless, people have started to show a timeline when it would be possible to have a second detector at an electron ion collider. So this is something that would follow behind you know, roughly four or five years um, on the first detector. And this is very fuzzy. So this is proceeding. And everything up to today is, is where we are. We're really into this design phase. Uh, and there are many aspects. These are aspects you can go uh, look at. Uh, one is the EIC yellow report. This is a horrifically long document, about two pages. I managed to get it to upload to the archive and compile. That's my greatest success. Uh, so if you want, you can check out my LaTeX. Um, it is quite a slog if you want to read all 902 pages. On the other hand, what is really nice that I think all of you should look at is the executive summary. So there's a summary of this 902 pages, roughly 10, 20 pages long, um, beautifully polished, carefully worded. And the other sections are phenomenal for reference. You want to look up a particular physics topic, you can do it at EIC. Uh, you can look in the physics detectors, use it like a, a encyclopedia or reference book. Anyway, that's how I look at it. That's one resource. Okay. Now I'm almost up to today. So what happened over the last year? So we went from kind of a generic idea. So this happened pretty much all of, during COVID lockdown. Work on refining the ideas, justifying the physics case, refining it, I should say, um, and really fleshing out what I wanted in the detectors. What the detectors need to be able to do to Get the science done. That was done in the yellow report. Now make it even more concrete. Collaborations formed, came up with ideas. There are three proposals. This was done over the last year. Uh, one called Athena, a core, Eche. Um, these are SketchUp models of all three designs. At a glance, they're all similar. Uh, they're all solenoidal magnets. 
They did have different characteristics. Uh, the Athena one, for example, could go to a three Tesla magnetic field. And, uh, the HA one is reusing the same magnet that's being used in SVNIX, the Bavar magnet. Uh, it can only go to 1.5 Tesla magnetic field. And the compact design one was basically an idea for a second detector, though they also um, proposed themselves that they could be the first detector. So three ideas came in. Uh, they were all reviewed uh, for cost, um, risk. Um, could they get the science done? Um, I think the committee was very positive on either the Eche group or uh, Athena group could get the science done, had a very strong uh, collaboration. Um, but again, you're now one of these points where a committee makes decisions. Uh, they decided to go with uh, the Eche. This is the 1.5 Tesla reuse magnet. Of course, reusing makes things a little cheaper. Uh, this is also a little bit smaller, which also cheaper. So this is March 22nd. So now we had another one of these winner loser uh, situations, but Again, okay, first, okay, you had winners, losers, feel happy, sad, human reaction, we get over it. And we're now coming, we are literally right now uh, coming back together as a community and going, okay, baseline has been decided. So some basic parameters. I know now the size of the magnet and the field of the magnet and the basic layout. And now we iterate again, because I don't want to just stop. I'm not going, this is, I'm building this. I want to take, or we all want to take the best ideas uh, from all three and combine them into this baseline. Do you think of it as iterative? And yeah, go ahead. What were the groups that were proposing each model? What do you mean? Like each of the detector concepts, what were the groups that were proposed to each? Um, okay. So the Athena, so it was a mishmash of scientists in each group, and there was a lot of overlaps. A lot of people worked on multiple ones. Uh, the Athena group had a lot of members of the STAR community, so the IP6 community at Brookhaven, and a good fraction of Jefferson Lab people scattered you know, from different halls. Uh, Eche was more the uh, Phoenix community, the IP8. They were using the Babar magnet. It's natural why the, that group was interested. Uh, more in this design, and again, had a spattering of Jefferson Lab people. Uh, the, the core one, this was more driven uh, by Old Dominion University in Stony Brook. It did not have as large a collaboration. The one thing that's amazing when you, when I say star and Phoenix, this is a collaboration bigger than class. So when those groups show up, they're, they're two huge uh, teams of people. So this one did not have as many, uh, let's say, scientists. Uh, involved. That's why I think for from the committee, if you just read the report, you make your own decisions, but they're pretty much focused on the, the big two, the, the Athena collaboration and the Eche collaboration. Sorry, Doc. Yeah. We have still five minutes. All right, perfect. All right. And from a historical point of view, I've, I've brought you up to today. This is what we're doing now. We're, we've down selected. We're not done. We're going to refine. We're going to take the best ideas from all, all the teams. Um, and we, we are literally just getting over this first human reaction of uh, winners, losers. And it, it happened again. But it, it is always nice to see people come back together. In fact, during the yellow report, we've all been working together. It, it, I thought a really great team. And when this uh, call for proposals came out, we broke into separate teams. I didn't actually like it. I actually preferred when we were kind of all together. But anyway, it was exercise that needed to be done. We needed to just really dig in deep. Do I need the 1.5 magnet or do I need to build the three Tesla? Let's do the science. Let's have a review committee decide independently. What do they, what do they think? Is it good enough or not? That's what's happening. All right. So just some really quick numbers. Uh, so it's roughly uh, 1,300 collaborators uh, already working on EIC. That's just slightly under the Jefferson Lab user community number. These are just ones that are formally uh, registered on the EIC user group page. Those are the ones that are, that are captured. Uh, just really quick, a couple things to point out to you all. So here at Jefferson Lab, we have something called EIC Center Fellowships. 
Uh, there are three for postdoctoral scientists and three for PhD students. Uh, and it's a bit of funding uh, for both to allow the advisor to have uh, the student or postdoc work on EIC science. Uh, the call for that is out. So if any of you all are really enthusiastic about EIC science, I strongly suggest you talk to your advisor. From my point of view, it works best when there's a synergy between your what you're doing right now for your thesis and EIC. And there's amazing overlaps, whether it's deeply elastic scattering, structure functions, uh, goes on. Then the polarized helium three experiment is proposed for class 12. It can also be done with EIC. All right, just flash up. These are our current fellows. Um, and the final thing I want to mention that's been very beneficial uh, is a detector testing program. So Jefferson Lab is not known as a detector testing facility by any means, but our users, our professors have been doing detector testing on the side uh, for as long as I can remember. So for 20 plus years, people have been putting little detectors near the beam, off to the side, uh, all the experimental halls will run a few cables, we'll test the detectors. What's happened recently is it's begun uh, to get a little more formal, uh, in particular in experimental hall D. Uh, behind there, electron positron uh, tagger is a beautiful location for doing testing. Um, Julia's done any tests there. Uh, we've done uh, modular ridge testing there, gem testing there. Um, so, so while this I mean, it's infancy, it's clear that uh, sector testing in Jefferson Lab is something that's going to not only continue, I think it's going to grow a little more formal over the years. So, just to wrap this up, so even though Jefferson Lab didn't win the site, we're not building an electron ion collider next door, uh, we have a really strong commitment to the IC. The science it is science many of us here really love and we're really excited about. So we're going to keep it going, keep pushing. We are heavily involved. And for any of you who are interested, on Fridays at 9.30, we have a weekly AIC meeting. Everyone is welcome to come, listen in. Topics are all over the place. We will do accelerator science, uh, nuclear physics, nuclear theory, detectors, different detector technologies. You can just look in the announcement if you're interested. If it looks like something you want to come or listen to, you're absolutely welcome. These fellowships are open. And I'd be remiss if I didn't point out two really neat opportunities for students. There's two very heavily subsidized uh, workshops coming up. Uh, one at Stony Brook, there's the EIC Center Early Career Workshop. Uh, this has got a lot of financial support from JLab and Brookhaven and others. Uh, and also there's the Photonuclear Gordon Conference. Uh, this one also has a lot of funding available for students. And What's kind of really cute about both of these is the these early career parts. So for you, I see early career workshop or careers and frontiers. It's organized by the students and postdocs. So these are the senior scientists coming up with the agenda. Uh, this is students and postdocs coming up with the agenda. Opportunity for younger people to talk uh, in front of your peers. And I will leave it there. Thank you. Questions, comments. So how do you show relax? Um, you add a relax going to cool the proton bay. So I was cooling the proton bay. Let's see. So you'll you correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe there's any need to cool the electron beam. It's just like here at Jarvis Lab. I so the electron beam off the photocathode into the machine, there is no cooling because the beam is gorgeous. I mean, it's hair sized gorgeous to begin with. So I don't need to cool it. It's not a spread out beam. It doesn't have a lot of transverse momentum. So the problem with my hadron beam is, it's not the, the forward momentum that's problematic, it's your transverse. So think of it as perpendicular momentum to the direction of motion and my, my beam bucket is oscillating about that. Sort of. That's why it's like thermodynamics, it's literally, Oscillating, I need to cool it. Electron beam, on the other hand, no, we, we need to cool the hadron beam. Could you cool an electron beam? I, yes. That's not our problem at the moment. Yeah. So if Jefferson Lab were to have like received the EIC or received funding or was chosen, what would happen to physics at the other halls? Oh, wow. 
someone was actually pointing this out the other day. Oh, come on, all the way back. So I had this question asked me in a different way, which was, so was Jefferson Lab lucky not to get awarded DIC? <laughs> and in a way, the answer is yes. So there's positives and negatives to everything. Let me start with the negative at Brookhaven. They have been awarded the electron ion collider. In order to get the award, they promised to redirect program funds to EIC. This means they're going away from something. They're going away from STAR and they're going away from S Phoenix. S Phoenix is not going to be able to run as long as many of us had hoped. And it's to ensure that the EIC project moves along and the promised funds have to, they have to move. So that program would end early. At Jefferson Lab, if we had gotten the collider, it would be similar. We have to start putting our resources mostly into the collider. Yes, we could continue to run the 12 GB program in the halls. Nothing precludes it, but it would be much, much slower than it is now. As, as things look right now, Jefferson Lab's gonna keep rocking on. Uh, we'll do as many experiments as we can every year. Um, in just a few more years, Brookhaven will stop the machine so they can do the installation of Detector 1. And there, for many years, it'll be off. And during that time, we'll be, say, the only game in town. Um, so we'll be doing a lot of science. So you can think of it from 2025 to 2030. Uh, this is where people will be coming. And this is why I really like the EIC fellow program, right? Because what I really want to do, the science overlaps a lot of physics. So deeply virtual confidence scattering comes to mind as one. But you can do those experiments and we will be doing them in experimental hall B, for example. In different kinematics, you'll be doing those experiments at the electron ion collider. So absolutely need to keep, let's say, the pipeline of students uh, engaged, trained, right? Because I can imagine the student from here uh, we're doing a postdoc at EIC, um, depending on the timing. In fact, uh, some of you in this room, I suspect that'll be exactly the case. Yeah. Um, why, uh, why is it wiggly? Why is it a wiggly circle, not a circle? Ooh, give a great technical answer, Julia, for the. So the, no, 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 no. So, and you're absolutely right. It's nice you noticed. So the Brookhaven machine is not circular at all as you get into the detail. It, it literally has all kinds of, uh, let's say, macroscopic detail as the, the beam wiggles around. The entire history of all the optics. So a lot of this comes back to the ion machine, which I was not involved with in any way of design, but you just think about the practical matter of putting in the magnets and the optics and where everything goes. Yeah, you end up with about a circle. A curiosity about the electron ion machine that's not evident in these pictures at all, in order to fit it in. So, okay, you won. Now let's really start drawing this up. And you try to put the electron ring in plane and you go, ooh, this doesn't fit very well. So the electron ring will be slightly tilted. It's just, a, it's tiny. I'm not even sure it's more than a degree, but they're gonna tilt it. Why? It gives them a lot more space on this side of the machine. And if I take a, a ring and tilt it against another ring, I can still have two points of contact. I need two points, I've got two interaction regions. Perfect. I give myself a little more space. I don't have to make the tunnel any bigger, but I had a little bit of space I could go up. So they tilt it. This is always most fun, not only in physics, uh, but in engineering, right? Like, once we came up with this, the engineers were like, uh, we need a little more room for magnets. And yeah, people come up with really clever solutions to things. Yeah, and the way how, how they I saw another question here, right? Oh, yeah. One thing that I was um, wondering is part of the reason that EIC or um, 
Brookhaven got the EIC because just looking at it, it seems like it would have been easier to kind of build it at um, Brookhaven than building something that look based on the picture looks like it's bigger than the current accelerator is at JLAB. Now, so is the um, Brookhaven upgrade like cheaper than building it at Yes, the cost is indeed one of the things that was considered. And this is a much bigger electron ring. This doesn't have the same scale. So you can put this entire facility inside the circle. Um, but, but nevertheless, this was a less expensive option, um, at least if you weren't interested in the polarized deuteron. So what's not in the baseline of the project um, in physics I would really like is doing polarized deuterons. That's going to require uh, more spin rotators. So once I have all the additional spin rotators, am I up to the cost of this? I don't know. But there's always a practical question, which is, okay, sure, maybe over the course of 20 years, the integrated cost of this might be cheaper than that. I need to get it built. You know, I want to get it built in a reasonable amount of time, and I'm only going to get some you know, reasonable or realistic increase in budget to make it happen. So you got to take in all these things. So this is a less expensive design, perhaps a little bit less risky. This was a little bit novel. Uh, it is interesting to note that the Chinese electronic collider has latched onto the figure eight design. It is very clever. If you're building from scratch the ion rings, the figure eight design is clever. Okay, I'll stop here just because time is running. Uh, so thanks again, Doug, for the talk. You also notice that out of the seven young scientists that were uh, shown here, four were former high school. So you are out of the best. <laughs>